It was a gradual thing. I loved to write when I was a child. I thought it was something I would do for fun. And it really, well, it really wasn't until I was in college. I, I wrote, but I always thought that was something that you did as a child, and then you put away childish things. Because I never knew any writers. I didn't know writers could be real life people. The first outbreak, the first instance of that maybe it was a possible thing happened in my last year of high school. Because I had a high school teacher who took me to a book signing by an author, John Charty. And that's when I saw my first live author. That's why I know it's so important to show show kids, you know, that, that there are real life people doing these things. But when I was in college, I took creative writing courses and I began to write more and more. And I realized I was scheduling my entire life around my writing courses. And I said, well, maybe you need to figure out if this is what you want to do. That was the point. At that point, I was in 12th grade. I did not know his work. Afterwards, of course, I began to read his work. But here was a living, breathing, walking, joking person who wrote books. And for me, it was that I loved to read, but I always thought of the, that, that was, the dream was too far away. The person who had written the book was, was, was a god, it wasn't a person. To have someone actually in the same room with me, talking, and you realize he gets up, he walks his dog, the same as everybody else, was a way of saying, it is possible. You can really walk through that door, too. That was the important thing. Well, my parents had two bookshelves and the two half walls of bookshelves. And they encouraged us to read whatever we wanted. Going to the library was the one place we could go to without asking really for permission. And what was wonderful about that was that the fact that they let us choose what we wanted to read for, for extra reading material. So it was a feeling of, of having a book be mine entirely, not because someone assigned it to me, but because I chose to read it. There was an anthology up there, one anthology of poetry. It was a purple and gold cover, I'll never forget it. It was really thick. It went from Roman, I mean, times all the way up to the 1950s at that point. And I began to browse. I mean, I really was like browsing. I read in it a little bit. Um, if I liked a poem by one person, I'd read the rest of them by that person. I had no idea, I was about 11 or 12 at this point, had no idea who these people were. I had heard of Shakespeare, sure, you know, but I didn't know the relative value of say, Shakespeare or Emily Dickinson or all of these people I was reading. So I really began to read what I wanted to read. And without anyone telling me that this was too hard, you know, you're only 11, how can you possibly understand, you know? Sarah Teasdale or something like that. And so that's how my love affair, I think, with poetry began. This was entirely my, my world, and I felt that they were whispering directly to me. Ah, oh, yes. Well, that happened in college, and that's, it seems kind of late, but um, it was a poem by Sylvia Plath called Daddy, which is a amazing poem, a hate poem really, to her father, which, which ends up saying, Daddy, Daddy, you bastard, I'm through. Now, it's an incredible poem because it is, it, it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a nursery rhyme. It rhymes in that way, and yet it has this incredible vehemence. And it was the first time I realized that you didn't have to be polite. You know, you raise, our parents are always concerned to raise you as you're a little animal, you know, in society. And, and I think that though they never really said directly there were things that you should or shouldn't say in, you know, in, in writing or in learning, they always encouraged us to go as far as we could. Still, I think there was this feeling that you had to be nice. I felt that. And that was an enormous release to be able to say, well, you know, it is not, on, not only the happy moments are things that should be talked about, but every moment, all the moments that make up a human being have to be written about, talked about, painted, danced, in order to really talk about life. So it was liberating in that sense. I think what I would try to do is to show them or talk to them about what it is about language and about music that enthralls us, because I think those are the two elements of poetry. And very often, people who are not familiar with poetry or don't know much about it are operating out of fear. At some point in their life, they've been given a poem to interpret and told that was the wrong answer, you know? Uh, I think we've all gone through that. I went through that. And, and, 
And it's unfortunate that sometimes in schools, it, it, this need to have things quantified and graded, we end up doing this kind of multiple choice you know, approach to something that should be as ambiguous and ever-changing as life itself. So I try to ask them, have you ever heard a good joke? You know, if, you, if you've ever heard someone tell a joke just right with the right pacing, then you're already on the way to poetry. It's really about using words in very precise ways and also using gesture as it goes through language, you know, not, not the gesture of your hands, but how language makes a, creates a mood. And if, and, you know, who, who can resist a good joke? When they get that far, then you realize, then they can realize that poetry is also, can also be fun. The first moment that really stood out in terms of public excitement and recognition was when I got the Pulitzer. Uh, I was 34. I had no idea I was being considered. It really was a moment of moving from, from a very private sense of life to a public sense. Uh, and I, I didn't even know the book was being considered. It was, I was very pleased it was that book, though, that in fact got the Pulitzer of Thomas and Beulah, which was a book about my grandparents. A uh, collection of poems that that dealt with their lives first his side and then her side of the story, and it it wasn't a spectacular book. It, nothing you know they didn't endure a train wreck or anything like that. They were living their lives in this quietly heroic way of many people in this country, and and that that book was chosen for the Pulitzer was was wonderful for me. I think personally, also for my parents it was wonderful, and um, I remember just feeling. Well, I got the Pulitzer on my husband's 40th birthday, and I was planning a surprise party. You know, I, I didn't have classes that day. I told everyone at the university, don't call me. We're going to have, I'm going to surprise him. And when the phone rang, and it was the chair of my department saying, I know you're there, speaking through the answer machine, I was thinking, you know, she's not supposed to disturb me. This is my day, you know. And uh, so when he said, Rita, this is really important, and I realized his voice was several octaves higher than usual, that was the moment when I really felt like, sort of like the camera lights came on into my life. It was quite distinct. And, and then the second big surprise was when I was asked to appoint a poet laureate. And again, it came totally out of the blue because most poet laureates had been considerably older than I. And it's not something I'd even begun to dream about. Um, so uh, there I thought after the Pulitzer, well, at least nothing will surprise me quite that much again in my life. And another one happened. <laughs> it was quite amazing. It offers someone as a spokesperson for literature and poetry in this country. Um, it, it means that one becomes an automatic role model. It means that, that people write me from all over the country asking me, and sometimes even telling me, what they think a poet laureate should do. And I found that immensely valuable. Instead of trying to come up and pontificate on what, you know, what literature is, to have people come and listen to people say, well, you know, we have to save the children first, so you need to talk with children. You need to make sure, you know, and talk to, to teachers and make sure they get poetry in the curriculum early. And I say, yes, this is something that, as a spokesperson for, for poetry and literature, I can do. You know, it, it means having, in a certain way, a platform from which to talk about something that's very near to me, about a very intimate art. So in that sense, it's the combination of the intimate and the public that I find so exciting about being Poet Laureate. It, it does hold that responsibility, and sometimes the shoulders begin to droop a bit. But, but I think every time I, I receive a letter from someone who simply wants to write, not because they want something, because they simply want to say, I just want to tell you how I what poetry means to me. I realize what hunger there is out there for people to be able to read and to write poetry, to feel a connection with other people on a very intimate, interior level. That, that buoys me up some. There are obligations, too, like distinct duties of a poet laureate. I plan a reading series or at the Library of Congress and advise the librarian on literary matters. And uh, then, but the rest is pretty much left up to me, how I want to promote poetry, how I want to bring it into the households. I had a couple of teachers who did inspire me. One was this 11th grade 
English teacher, 11th and 12th grade. And she, I still, still, you know, we still have tea together sometimes today. Um, I was frightened before I went to her class. I heard she was a battle axe. I heard that she, you know, would flunk you if you split an infinitive. And it's true, she would, but she also would tell you what a split infinitive was. And then you, once you knew, you never did it again. She just opened up to me how language, how the written word can also sing. And she spent, I remember once, 45 minutes on one page, the first page of a novel. By the end of the class, everyone was, you know, no one had taken down a single note because we were absolutely enthralled. It was incredible. Her name was Miss Oshner, Margaret Oshner. And as I said, we still, you know, every time I go back home to Akron, Ohio, I, we, we get together and have lunch or tea or something like that. And there were others. I had a ninth grade English teacher, Mr. Hicks, who um, put us in groups and, and, and gave us impossible poems to interpret. And when I say impossible, I mean poems which had Greek in them, a little bit of Greek and a little, languages we couldn't even, we couldn't even read the alphabet. And he said, just tell me what it means. Tell me what you think it means. And after a couple of class periods, when we decided this is so impossible, we might as well just make a wild guess. It turned out our guesses weren't so wild after all. So he taught us that to trust what your gut reaction was to something, even if you didn't understand every word to work out the context. And in college, a couple of fantastic teachers, both a um, prose teacher, a teacher who taught fiction, who strolled into class the first day and said, we're gonna tell stories, who's gonna start? And we're all going, <gasps> we thought we were gonna have a chance to write it down on paper. No, he made us talk, he made us begin a story. Not, didn't have to end it, but just how are you gonna catch someone's attention? What are you gonna say right away? It was a phenomenal lesson. So there, there have been people all along. But I think the most important influence was really my parents. The fact that from a very early age, though my father is a chemist, my mother is a housemaker, um, I have a brother and two sisters who are all chemists or mathematicians, the whole family is full of scientists. Yeah, the one thing that was important was the fact that you just never said, I don't get it, I'm going to give up. But you start then small and you work at it a little bit at a time. The feeling that, 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 the feeling that learning was the most exciting thing that could happen to you, and it never ends, and isn't that great? I think it is imagination. I, mean, I think that without imagination, we can go nowhere, and, I, and imagination is not something that's just restricted to the arts. Every scientist that I have met who has been a success has had to imagine. You have to imagine it possible before you can see something sometimes. You can have the evidence right in front of you, but if you can't imagine something that, that has never existed before, it's impossible. And and with imagination, I mean, there are, there are a lot of other characteristics I think you need too. You know, you need determination and you need to have some sense, some faith in the human ability to, to persevere and you know, to triumph. Whether you have faith in yourself as that human being is a different point, but at least the faith of human beings can do it. But imagination in a certain way contains all of those things too, because you have to imagine that it is possible for human beings to do something before you can do it. The first thing I tell them is to read. I mean, I feel that if they don't read, if they don't love reading, if they don't find themselves compulsively reading like, like print as they walk by, you know, a shopping mall, anything, then I don't think they're really a writer. Then it's the ego talking. Because inherent in the idea of being a writer is to have the whole continuum, have the whole circle be completed. You know, that feeling as a writer that you are writing, someone else is going to pick this up and read it, and it's not completed until that person reads it. If you haven't taken part in that continuum, how can you even know how it's going to work? That's the first thing. The next thing I tell them to do is to um, well, Hemingway once said that more writers fail from lack of character than lack of talent. You know, it is not a question of sitting down under a tree and having inspiration come down. If you wait for inspiration, the inspiration is going to go away and look for more fertile ground to work with. There's a lot of work involved in it, too. There's a lot of feeling that you're almost there, but you don't you don't even know how to get to that point in the poem, and then you just simply keep working, you keep writing, you keep rewriting. And to know that everyone goes through that, and that's part of the process, and it's actually a fun part of the process. 
uh, it's, it's very important to. I, I think I would also tell them that they can only write what, this sounds corny, but they can only write what they feel. That doesn't mean they have to have experienced it. But to write something for, because someone else thinks it's right to write that, to write for PC reasons to write because you think you ought to be dealing with this subject, it's never going to yield anything that is really going to matter to anyone else. It has to matter to you. And uh, come what may, even if it just doesn't seem to be at all socially acceptable, if that's how you feel, that's really what you have to write. Being true to yourself really means being true to, the, to all the complexities of the human spirit. And as much as we'd like to give and we want to be perfect, well-rounded individuals, all of us have our quirks. We all know we've had our foibles and we've got these, these embarrassing moments in our lives and things that we're ultimately ashamed of. What writing, what I think all the arts do, is to reveal, to let us see again and experience again all the ambiguities that make up and the contradictions that make up a human being, the good and the bad, and how they can exist in one person and, and, and make a complex individual. And to do that, that means being very honest, being honest all the time. Well, the American dream is a phrase that we'll have to wrestle with all of our lives uh, and, and on and on to our children's lives. It means a lot of things to different people. I think that we're re redefining it now. For a long time, the American dream meant, you know, a, a chicken in every pot and a frigidaire, right? <laughs> you know, you need a frigidaire in the kitchen. And, and now we're beginning to realize, to realize that the American dream really is not about uniformity, but it's about it's about, I don't want to say diversity. What I want to say is it's more like a mosaic. It's not a melting pot, it's a mosaic. And that we all contribute our tiles to making up that big picture. And that's glorious. That's nothing to be afraid of. To me, that's what, you know, certainly the American dream is the entire mosaic when you back up. And when you get in there, there's a whole bunch of little dreams put in there. So that's what I think.